Okay, thank you very much for having me. Um, you know, thanks for squeezing me in, and I realize that, you know, with much kind of coming up, that, uh, you know, I'll try to keep this light on the mathematics and sort of focus on the concepts and takeaway principles. So I'm going to be talking about quantum annealing, which uh, is a quantum algorithm that gets a lot of press these days. And I'm going to be talking about some, some reasons why it's maybe a little unclear how much of an advantage we can get from quantum annealing and why there are some uh, significant sort of goals uh, on the technological side that might be able to uh, substantially improve this algorithm to uh, sort of get beyond the reach of classical simulations. So the general idea is that we're going to be thinking about the problem of optimization, where you um, are optimizing over some discrete domain. So here's the set of n-bit strings, and you're just trying to find the string which produces the minimum value uh, for some function f. And the general idea is we're going to take inspiration from physical processes that uh, drive physical systems to low energy states. So we're going to kind of associate our uh, abstract function f, which is some cost function that you might care about, like the, uh, you know, the um, distance covered by a traveling salesman you know, taking a tour through several cities. And we're going to associate that with an energy and try to use dynamics from physics to inspire new algorithms. So sort of the, the, the one, the algorithm that kicked this all off in the 1980s is uh, classical simulated annealing, which is a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm that simulates the process of thermal cooling. Um, so of course annealing is something that has been used for thousands of years in metallurgy to produce more stable metals. And um, so, so the idea with classical simulated annealing is that you uh, you attempt to sample from a Gibbs distribution at a sequence of temperatures, starting from very high temperature and slowly cooling down. And you're running some kind of random walk or a Glauber dynamics or metropolis transition probabilities. There are a lot of different names for it, but you're, but you're running some kind of dynamics on a spin system and you're attempting to sample from a classical Gibbs distribution as you slowly cool the temperature down. And this classical Gibbs distribution, right, your energy function is specified by this uh, by this sort of abstract function f. So the big the big question is, can quantum dynamics inspire faster optimization methods? Okay, and uh, you know an answer to this was perhaps provided by the proposed adiabatic optimization algorithm. So here we attempt to minimize this function f by creating a Hamiltonian which will have this as its lowest energy ground state. So here I've kind of indicated a Hamiltonian that's meant to be diagonal in the computational basis. You could think of constructing this function f out of like sigma z operators. And what you do in the adiabatic algorithm is you initialize the qubits into a very simple ground state, which is this uniform transverse field. You could think of it just as a transverse magnetic field. And um, you interpolate from this simple Hamiltonian to the complicated one that contains the solution to your problem in its ground state. Okay, and the reason it's called the adiabatic optimization is that it uses something called the adiabatic theorem, which says that if you begin in an eigenstate of a Hamiltonian and you change the Hamiltonian parameters very slowly, then you're, you're going to remain in that eigenstate. And uh, specifically, the mathematical condition looks at the spectral gap away from that eigenstate. So if you're looking at the ground state, then the way that you can determine whether your adiabatic optimization algorithm is efficient is to say that you have you know, a spectral gap to the first excited state. And this kind of controls the runtime of your algorithm and gives you a, a guaranteed sufficient condition to solve your problem. And uh, um, maybe a more recent term, so adiabatic optimization goes back about maybe 15 years or so, but a more recent term is quantum annealing, which kind of accounts for the fact that in the real world, you'll never be at perfect zero temperature in a ground state. You might have, you know, you might not have perfect unitary evolution because, again, these are open quantum systems. So, so quantum annealing means various things to various people, but generally speaking, you're including more realistic effects in this adiabatic model. You're probably still trying to produce the ground state, but maybe you have a little bit of overlap. Um, you, you're at some low temperature quantum Gibbs state. Okay, so, um, you know, can these quantum effects help us? Well, an important intuition for this is that quantum dynamics um, might be able to tunnel through energy barriers that would take a long time to climb over using uh, thermal fluctuations, right? So, 
Imagine you're on the left there and you're a small particle in this local minimum and you're just bouncing around with thermal fluctuations. Well, it might take you a very long time to, you know, by some good fortune, have to climb over this barrier and find the true global minimum that it minimizes this, this entire uh, function here. Whereas using quantum dynamics, you might be able to pass through this barrier more efficiently, no matter how high it is, if it's not too, you know, if it's not too wide, you might have a decent probability of tunneling through that forbidden region to arrive on the other side. Okay, so um, this intuition is backed up by some theory that co actually comes from uh, some of the guys who originally proposed the adiabatic algorithm, so it's Eddie Farvey and his collaborators at MIT, and they showed that quantum annealing can be exponentially faster than classical simulated annealing for particular examples that display this type of feature. Right, so these are kind of like uh, toy models that you know theorists like to play with, um, you know, because we can actually solve things and we can do the math, but, but um, this is really believed to be a general feature that occurs <laughs> in realistic problem instances and has driven a lot of the uh, interest in the quantum adiabatic algorithm. Okay, so, all right, so the point we just made is that quantum annealing can take advantage of multi-spin tunneling to uh, outperform these classical methods that are widely used in practice, not just simulated annealing, but all these sort of modern variants that improve on the original method, parallel tempering, population annealing. There's a whole slew of them, um, and they all sort of get stumped on these high energy barriers, <coughs> all these local search methods, where it's quantum annealing somehow, you know, uses this tunneling power to, uh, to, to exponentially outperform all of those. Okay, but there's a counterpoint to this, which is that the transverse field quantum annealing Hamiltonian, remember we have this sort of, you could think of it as diagonal. So we like to think in the computational basis, so our F function was a diagonal Hamiltonian matrix, and the transverse field uh, represents the off-diagonal terms. And so in fact, these types of Hamiltonians don't have a sign problem. And so in principle, you could apply these methods known as quantum Monte Carlo. So quantum Monte Carlo might seem like a confusing name because uh, you know it has quantum in it, but it's actually a classical algorithm. So broadly speaking, we'll explain a little more as we go on, but with quantum Monte Carlo, you take your quantum spin system and you map it onto a classical spin system. And somehow they have the same partition functions so that if you can run the classical dynamics to uh, sample from the classical Gibbs distribution, this somehow gives you information about your quantum observables as well. So quantum Monte Carlo, again, classical algorithm that simulates quantum systems by Monte Carlo method. And in principle, you could apply this to the transverse field quantum annealing Hamiltonian. But, well, even though quantum Monte Carlo has seemed to work very well in practice in a condensed matter context, there's a big difference between systems that are translationally invariant, <coughs> physically realistic, without any disorder, and the kind of systems that we want to use to encode hard computational problems. Okay, so, so in fact, these classical spin glasses, even without any quantum effects, um, can encode these NP-complete problems, which we don't really have to explain what that is, but that just means we don't think any computer could ever solve these NP-complete problems efficiently, whether it's a classical or a quantum computer. And um, so because you can encode these NP-complete problems into uh, classical spin systems, we kind of know from general considerations that quantum Monte Carlo isn't going to always work. Right, it's a heuristic, it seemed to often work in practice, but we have no theoretical guarantees that say, oh, well, this method's always gonna work. Okay, so, but now the counterpoint to this is um, a result I had last year with uh, uh, my former PhD advisor. Um, we proved that this simulated quantum annealing based on the quantum Monte Carlo method can converge efficiently for, for this class of examples from Farkey et al. And so in fact, um, simulated quantum annealing, which is a classical algorithm, can sort of capture this exponential advantage over the thermal classical annealing, right? So simulated quantum annealing can be exponentially faster than classical simulated annealing, okay? Um, so, so indeed, we shouldn't necessarily think of this multi-spin tunneling process as, well, it's not, it's not always going to be a quantum advantage. Sometimes it could be captured by this classical simulation algorithm. Okay, and this just isn't about theory and toy models. So this, uh, this graph here comes from some work by other people that I wasn't involved with, but uh, there are people at Google, and uh, they found that this quantum Monte Carlo has a similar scaling with quantum annealing 
for these um, randomized cluster problems that they actually designed to exploit just this effect that Fargate et al. point to, which is you know the high energy barriers that you can tunnel through might give you a big advantage. So they actually compared this uh, D-Wave hardware with about a thousand qubits, and um, so you can see there you have D-Wave in blue, you have simulated annealing in red, and uh, on the horizontal axis you're looking at the problem size getting bigger and bigger. And on the vertical axis, you're looking at some normalized measure of the total runtime at that problem size to get a good solution to your problem. So, so what we look at as theorists is how these algorithms scale, right? Because ultimately, we want to solve problems that are a lot larger than just a thousand bits. We want to go up to millions and so on. So, so if you look at the scaling here, you can see that um, D-Wave is clearly beating simulated annealing. So indeed, the predicted exponential advantage is showing up when you compare quantum annealing, uh, D-Wave, with the simulated annealing. But um, if you compare the slopes of the D-Wave curve with the quantum Monte Carlo curve, well, they're actually quite similar. And um, so this is kind of, to me, an empirical evidence that what we're seeing in the theory also bears out in these more complicated practical problems of interest. But in defense of D-Wave, something very important to point out here is that there's this huge sort of vertical offset for the quantum Monte Carlo curve, and that, that corresponds to a prefactor. Um, actually, if you read the vertical axis, it's a prefactor of 10 to the 8th, which is a huge amount of time. And this corresponds to sort of the overhead in the classical simulation. So they may scale the same way once you set them up, but just to get the classical simulation started kind of involves a lot of overhead, and computer memory, and extra time, and so on. Um, and so, so, okay, so then you could make the point that even if simulated quantum annealing could always match the scaling of quantum annealing, well, simulated quantum annealing has this large prefactor of overhead. And, you know, if you were to implement quantum annealing, well, it's an analog implementation, so it's very fast, right? It doesn't, it doesn't come with this, this big overhead. But then, you know, you could also say, well, what if we spent nine-digit figures of venture capital for a hardware implementation of the classical simulated annealing. I think that's actually a pretty good idea. You might have a hard time convincing, convincing the venture capitalists that it would be exciting, um, but uh, you know, I think that would be a, a more fair competition between the various methods. But, um, but no, I, I don't mean to dismiss the importance of this prefactor, right? Because even if you could, couldn't obtain a scaling advantage, um, simply solving these problems twice as fast I mean, what happens, right? Every, every few years, Intel comes out with the next generation of processors that are 10% faster, and we all spend money to upgrade. So, so, you know, it would only take a slight advantage. You don't need an exponential advantage to justify uh, spending in new technologies. Um, okay, this is also kind of maybe a, a slightly uh, more theoretical interest, but we sort of, we also know, besides this spin glass argument, we also know that, um, Simulated quantum annealing can run into issues with topological obstructions. So some of you may know that quantum Monte Carlo is, um, well, a standard version of it is based on the path integral method, where you you sort of um, sample you sample paths that contribute to the path integral describing the thermal physics of your system. And these paths are actually loops in the space of space. They have periodic boundary <coughs> conditions in the uh, imaginary time direction. So this kind of gives them a topological feature and something that actually shows up in condensed matter when you're simulating topological models is that you might have a hard time with just these uh, with these loops that could get wrapped around cylinders and things like that and have a very global property, say, related to the winding number around the cylinder that may, might take a very long time to equilibrate. And so, in fact, these kind of things can foil um, simulated quantum annealing in particular examples um, and, and you know, as of now, we don't have any existing quantum Monte Carlo method that um, even has a chance of simulating all of transverse field quantum annealing. But that, that doesn't mean we, we should give up, right? So the counterpoint is, yes, that's a very exciting theoretical challenge, and I'm working on it. But the real technological challenge, I think, is to create quantum annealing hardware where there's no real hope of a classically efficient simulation, right? None are known and none are expected for say, theoretical reasons. So how can we do that? Well, in more detail, these Hamiltonians without a sign problem, there's sort of this modern terminology. Um, it's a bit of jargon, but I think it is worth introducing to you guys. They're called stochastic Hamiltonians. 
uh, which is a you know combination of the words quantum and stochastic. And um, so these are Hamiltonians that have real and non-positive matrix entries in some choice <coughs> spaces, right? So all of the off-diagonal entries you could think of it as zero or negative. And uh, this is what this is what physicists always meant about the sign problem. So why do we have to give it a new name? Well, um, okay, uh, you, you could ask that, but but the point is people are starting to use this term more and more. And uh, you know, when I started as a graduate student, I thought this is a strange term and it was obscure. But now you go to an adiabatic quantum computing conference and it shows up all over the place. And literally, experimentalists are talking about it. So. Um, Okay, so what are some properties of these stochastic Hamiltonians? Well, the main thing that makes them special, so if the Hamiltonian has all these non-positive off-diagonal elements, then when you compute the thermal density matrix and look at it, we're not, okay, I, I also want to emphasize this is the basis-dependent property. So it's really the statement whether you can find some choice of basis to remove the sign problem from your Hamiltonian or not. Right, so stochastic means you don't have a sign problem if you're clever enough to choose the right basis. And once you choose that basis, well then your thermal state ends up being a non-negative matrix. That actually just follows from taking the Taylor series and you're getting sort of sums and powers of uh, non-negative terms because you have this minus sign in front of H. And so in fact all the, all the entries in your thermal density matrix are non-negative. And so in fact this also means that your ground state, which is like a temperature go to zero, version of the, uh, of the thermal density matrix, that this will also have non-negative amplitudes. So if you have a quantum state with non-negative amplitudes, it kind of starts to look a little more like a probability distribution and not so genuinely quantum. Right? You can't have this property of interference of phases in the ground state in particular. Um, right, so these guys are always sort of amenable to these quantum Monte Carlo methods, at least in principle. And there's also sort of good computational theoretic evidence that these stochastic ground states have some lower computational power. You know, the complexity of the local Hamiltonian problem or something like that. If you restrict the terms in your Hamiltonian to have this stochastic property, you know, it's going to be low, lower down on the sort of totem pole of, uh, you know, complexity uh, that, that exists out there. Um, so, so then we want to talk about non-stochastic Hamiltonians. These are, this is just the negation of the stochastic ones, right? So, um, they're Hamiltonians for which no local change of basis can get rid of the sign problem. It's somehow intrinsic and you can't eliminate it. And by local change of basis, you know, I've just been applying local unitaries that are of reasonable size, maybe one or two local. I mean, okay, just, just maybe you're thinking, wait, can I always go to the energy eigenbasis, you know, and then have all non-negative energies? But that's a huge non-local transformation. So we don't want to include things like that. We want to include, you know, just kind of changing what you label as X and Z. That's like a standard, you know, version of, of this, um, of a local change of basis. Okay, so one fact is that universal quantum computation can be implemented in the adiabatic model using non-stochastic Hamiltonians. So if you could, you know, so, so we certainly don't think that quantum computation can be classically simulated. And so, you know, if you can do this, this if you can implement universal quantum computation in a non-stochastic adiabatic model, well, this is good evidence that no generally efficient classical simulations are expected for these non-stochastic ground states. Okay, but let's actually look at that argument in a bit more detail. So universal adiabatic computation um, is very elegant. It's based on an idea that goes back to uh, Feynman's original proposal about quantum computers. Um, and so what you do is you create something called a history state of a quantum circuit, which is a superposition over sort of time steps that your circuit would take. Right? So if you imagine expanding out this sum, well, here I'm acting on the uh, n qubit zero register. And the register labeled T records which step of the computation I'm on, right? So T equals one, I've maybe applied one gate. T equals two, I've applied two. And somehow your ground state is a superposition of all of these. This is a very elegant idea, and you can write down the local Hamiltonian that enforces this ground state, and you can prove that your spectral gap is what it needs to be to make this all efficient. And so, indeed, this is theoretically equivalent to the quantum circuit model. And I should say, something. One of the reasons people are interested in adiabatic computing is ground states, or very low temperature thermal states, are somehow inherently more stable, right? We're expecting some, some kind of uh, advantage in, in how stable they are, because again, 
All you have to do is keep your system at a very cold temperature, right? And then your spin model should, in theory, be forced to uh, remain in its ground state. So, but universal adiabatic quantum computing is, you know, a shining beacon on a hill. It's extremely technologically challenging. It's very far off. So it requires many additional qubits just to form this clock register. So normally you think of running a quantum circuit um, on n qubits, and uh, you only need those n qubits. But if you wanted to do this thing, you have to say, <coughs> implement the clock. And if you have capital T time steps in your computation, well, you're probably going to use about capital T qubits just to represent the clock in the state I've written here. Okay, and the Hamiltonian terms um, are sort of naturally phi local. It's not necessarily apparent the way this is written, but you know the gates themselves are too local, and you have to sort of step the time register. And uh, so people have worked on this um, theoretical, you know, work has gone into trying to get these interactions down to be too local. And this is considered efficient, but I don't think it's really that efficient because you have to use these things called perturbative gadgets, which essentially amounts to saying that you have orders of magnitude difference in the coupling strengths in your system, right? So that should be something pretty hard to engineer. Um, and also, sort of fault-tolerant error correction for the universal AQC is an open problem. So, um, you know, we talked about maybe there's a bit of inherent reduction in noise by being in a ground state, but at the same time, you can have other problems. You can have control errors in the terms of your Hamiltonian and things like that that are gonna prevent you from um, achieving fault tolerance. And these are, these are problems that haven't even been solved theoretically. And then finally, so if, if you're implementing the gate model adiabatically, well, then you, you need some kind of clever quantum algorithm to get a provable speed up. You know, if you want to do factoring in the adiabatic model, well, that's a very specific sequence of gates that you're going to need to apply, right? So if, if all we do is we take the transverse field term in our quantum annealing Hamiltonian and we say, well, make it more general somehow, give it a sign problem, make it non-stochastic. Well, then sort of the, the overall utility for that is unknown. We know it's going to be hard to classically simulate in general, which is good. That's a good step. But at the same time, we don't know if it's going to give us amazing speed ups or not. It's the kind of thing that we're working to theoretically analyze, but we also can't wait for people to uh, build it as well so that you know we can uh, get some empirical benchmarks. Um, because that, that's been something very exciting. I should say about you know D-Wave and, and their stochastic quantum hardware is that we finally get to see how this heuristic algorithm that's been around for a decade and a half, how does it compare on realistic instances that are too complicated for us to uh, diagonalize computationally or anything like that. Okay, so can we engineer these non-stochastic Hamiltonians? Well, so I've been told that flux qubits are especially well suited to having these local transverse fields these one local magnetic fields. Well, implementing these non-stochastic interactions or anything really more general than, so, okay, you have one basis, which is like your Z basis, and you can do a lot there. You have very nice controllable interactions. But then you try to get this sort of complementary off-diagonal basis with these X terms, and there it becomes very hard to do anything more general than just these one local fields. And if you think about it, even if you could make, say, some of these local fields positive and the others negative, well, that wouldn't really get rid of the sign, or that wouldn't really create a sign problem, right? We want a sign problem because that makes it more quantum. But that wouldn't really create a sign problem because you could just do a local change of basis, switch around up and down, right? So you somehow have to uh, go beyond just these local, one local field terms if you want to uh, have this intrinsic, inescapable sign problem. Okay, um, nature itself actually seems to have a deep preference for stochastic Hamiltonians. So despite the fact that you, you don't hear about this when you take quantum mechanics, right? They, what do we have students solving is the Schrodinger equation. And uh, you know they, they do all these problems in one dimension or the hydrogen atom. Well, they're all stochastic, actually. So if you take spinless particles and you have your kinetic energy term, you have arbitrary potentials that they could live in, arbitrary interactions, it's all stochastic because sort of this, this second derivative, your kinetic energy, is the only place you're getting off diagonal terms, and in fact, you know, they're always going to have this uh, real and non-positive property, if you think of a discretized form of the uh, kinetic <coughs> energy operator. Okay, 
and uh, well, and then other other things about the standard model. So the very fact that people can do sort of lattice QCD, that's a quantum Monte Carlo method, and um, you know, so you can even put these sort of Yang Mills uh, gauge theories, you can you can at least explore properties of their vacuum, which is analogous to the ground state, um, by using quantum Monte Carlo methods. And so, in a sense, those are stochastic. So the main way in the standard model that you get something not stochastic are fermions, um, because even their ground states have to be anti-symmetric combinations. And remember, stochastic ground states had all non-negative amplitudes. They're like, their amplitudes already look like a probability distribution. And, but if you take fermions, you now get negative amplitudes, even in the ground state. And that's really cool. Um, okay, um, so, but, so, so the easiest way I could say it is that to get this genuine stochastic property that you couldn't remove with a local basis transformation, then you need the interactions of your Hamiltonian to be frustrated in both directions simultaneously. Okay, both the z and the x. And this isn't, this isn't a sufficient condition, but I would say it's necessary. And the reason it's not sufficient is, say I took something like the, the D-Wave machine, which is stochastic, and then I just kind of change z and x by 45 degrees, right? Then it might look, might look frustrated in two complementary bases at the same time, but if I was clever enough, I'd change back to the usual z and x, and all of my off-diagonal elements wouldn't have a sign problem anymore. So you really want something that is frustrated in more than one, you know, in any choice of direction. You frustrate multiple complementary directions. So in fact, a two-qubit system is never going to be enough. Whatever sort of interaction you put between these two qubits, you're not going to create frustration. You need at least three parties to say, you know, A wants to agree with B, and B wants to disagree with C, and A wants to agree with C, and now we're frustrated. We kind of can't, we can't, um, we can't make everybody happy in all the directions at the same time. So this is this is an important <coughs> point because you know maybe someday somebody's going to say, well, could you could you make a non-stochastic interaction? And if you build it on two qubits, that's great. You come up with some way to do it. But you really need to build a frustrated system before your sign problem is intrinsic and inescapable. So what I'm saying is you need to watch out for these secretly stochastic Hamiltonians. Right? Um, they might appear to have simultaneous frustration, but they're actually stochastic by some clever trick. So a very well-known example of this is the anti-ferromagnetic Heisenberg model anti-ferromagnetic, it's frustrated, but in fact, if it's on a bipartite lattice, um, which could be a linear chain, a square lattice, a cubic lattice, or just any bipartite graph, right, this means you can partition the vertices of the lattice into two sets, um, such that you, you know, you only have edges between the sets and none within the sets. Um, and uh, something that came out of some work I did last year as well is noticing that Every Hamiltonian that is tridiagonal in some local basis is also secretly stochastic. So you might, so so these kind of Hamiltonians tend to represent <coughs> hopping on a line, and you might think you could have some sort of weird weird term controlling the hopping. You know, these B's on the off diagonal might be arbitrary complex um, matrix elements, but in fact, this is actually always hiding a stochastic Hamiltonian um, after you apply a, a, a transformation. Okay, so I think a minimal example that would be really cool to see would be three qubits in a triangle with antiferromagnetic interactions between them, right? And um, of course, these need to be controllable interactions. That's the whole point. Like condensed matter theorists might say, well, maybe maybe there's some Kagome lattice with antiferromagnetic interactions, and maybe that's something we can find in material one day, and that's like intrinsically frustrating, so it's not stochastic. But we really want to have controllable interactions um, on a small system of qubits with this inherent frustration in them. Um, okay, so transverse field quantum annealing can be exponentially faster than simulated annealing, and that's great. Uh, but it also turns out that this speed up can at least sometimes be captured by classical simulations of quantum annealing. Okay, so it's, it's certainly not the end of the story. Now, there are major open challenges, I think, to engineering controllable interactions with this sort of inescapable sign problem. People have been really starting to work hard on this for the last few years. Um, it's ramping up. You hear about it more and more. Um, now, these non-stochastic interactions might find some theoretical justification. You know, one, one day, 50 years from now, maybe, maybe we'll be able to use universal adiabatic computing, but that's a distant goal. 
a more near-term um, goal would be to just, just change this transverse field in our quantum healing algorithms to have a sun problem and see if that provides us with, with some bit more of quantum speed up. Okay, so, so that's, that's more of a near-term goal that would be great to see, do this in superconducting hardware or something like that. And with that, we'll conclude. <laughs> Definition of in this definition of um, in this definition of stochastic Hamiltonians. Why, why is it that you restrict yourself to local transformations to remove the um, side problem? Um, that's a good question. I mean, specifically, we want local unitaries. Um, so it would be a bit trivial, like I said, if you could apply global transformations, you could change to the energy eigenbasis, but you could always just sort of add an arbitrary shift to your energies and then your Hamiltonian would be diagonal, and you wouldn't even have any off-diagonal elements. But it's kind of like if you if you think about these hard computational systems, um, then transforming to the energy eigenbasis it would be some fantastically complex operation that you could never implement. So, so it's really something that the difference between these local transformations and the global ones shows up as you start to have maybe hundreds of qubits or something like that, where you know, the global transformation correspond to, it'd be like applying a unitary gate, you know, that's not acting on two qubits, but acting on 100 at the same time. And that's just, that's not really realistic in, in both physically, but also from a theoretical point of view, it just represents too much power. It's a power we don't have. Um, Although it's needed in Grover's, I think. Uh, yeah, that's true. Grover's an oracle problem. Um, okay, that's, that's fair. But yeah, so, so the answer is that it, it, it's to avoid the sort of over simple solution of just diagonalizing. Which is something we can't do in general, right? So so if you have a Hamiltonian that is analytically tractable and you know what the energy eigenvalues and the energy eigenstates are, you might be able to do the transformation, right? But if you have some complicated spin glass, like a transverse field spin glass Hamiltonian, then um, you know it's going to be way too complex to do that transformation in a complexity theoretic sense, right? It's going to be beyond NP-hard. It would just give you these give you these solutions to these problems we don't think we could ever solve. But local could be beyond nearest neighbors. It could absolutely include nearest neighbors. It's kind of this concept of k-local. So it could be two local, three local, however much you might think is realistic in some sense, but not scaling with the system size, not scaling with your number of qubits in. Any other questions? Uh, it is lunchtime. So maybe we'll thank all the speakers from this morning. We've now got an hour.